Our guests in this segment include Teresa McCabe from WVU Medicine. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, guys. And Joni Stenick. Good morning, Joni. Good morning. Did I say it right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you are the coordinator for Donate Life Month. Do I have that accurate? I, I am the director of Trauma and Critical Care Services at WV Medicine at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and our organ donation program falls underneath of me, so I coordinate all of the events. Um, April is Donate Life Month, where we bring awareness to eye, organ, and tissue donation. Um, and so I work uh, cohesively with our marketing department, social media, and photography department to really bring awareness, <clears throat> not just to the people in the community, but also to the employees um, within our building who may need some more information as well. So to uh, donate, <clears throat> is, it as, is it as simple as going to the DMB and signing up to be an organ donor? That's one way. Um, that's probably the most common way people uh, find out about organ donation. Um, you can also go to um, you know, Google search and look um, under Donate Life um, uh, dot org. That's another opportunity. It goes by state. So if you go to the donate life dot org, you can pick your state of residency and register through there. Um, but most commonly, people go to the DMV and check mark the box when they do their driver's license. If you do it in life, well, on my driver's license, obviously there is something that notes that I am a, an organ donor. If I haven't done it that way, how would a person know that John is a former firefighter EMS guy how would he know if he comes upon a scene and I'm deceased unfortunately that I'm an organ donor if it's not on my license so um, there is a registry um, like I said you can use the the uh, platform for your uh, driver's license um, otherwise if you would meet some clinical triggers that would um, indicate in the inpatient setting that there perhaps um, may be an opportunity um, you know, for you to be an organ donor, say that you've had a, a detrimental accident, um, you're you're looking like um, there may be a potential for brain death. Um, we have a partnership at WVU Medicine with LifeNet Health, um, and so that's when we would contact those individuals, and that entity would come in and and they would be able to do a search to see if you're on the registry. Um, if you're not done through your, your driver's license, you can do registerme.org um, or donatelife.org. Those are other, other ways, but um, our partnership with LifeNet Health allows us to be able to find out if you're on any registry. Are most people donors now? Well, they say about 90% of people support organ donation, but only about 60% of people are registered. Um, so there's a big, big gap in, in I supporting it and I want to register. Um, so I support an organ if I need it, but if I don't, <laughs> you give it. Yeah. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why April we really focus on awareness and making sure, you know, people have information and access to information so that they're making the most informed decision if they want to be an organ donor, um, that they have the information available to make that decision because it is a pretty important decision, a very generous decision um, that really can impact many people's lives. John, you've been on the scene. T take me through how that scenario works, or if you even have to deal with that at the scene. I never dealt with it. In fact, that's the, the question I wanted to ask. What are the logistics? You know, if I ran, well, I ran in Virginia, and, and in Virginia, back when I was doing it, EMTs could not uh, declare death. So that was, they were always, I always delivered a live patient. We might be doing CPR or whatever, mm -hmm. unless, you know, you have to take two steps between ventilation and contraction. You know, then you, you could, if they're clearly dead, mm -hmm. they're dead. So we didn't deal with that, but when somebody does come in uh, into the emergency room and they don't have the organ card, it's not on their driver's mm -hmm. license if they've signed up with donatelife.org or whatever, how do you know? What are logistics of figuring that out? Because it's, it's, a, it's a dead guy. Right. So um, like I said, our partnership with LifeNet Help, all of our referrals go to them. Um, if, it, if it's somebody that unfortunately comes in deceased, um, we have a responsibility to notify LifeNet Health of that individual. Um, so then they would be able to search that on the background to see if they're registered. Um, it comes into play when they are deceased for tissue um, and corneal um, and maybe bone, skin grafts, those kinds of pieces um, could, could be um, extrapolated at that point. 
But if it's somebody that comes in as an inpatient who's still, you know, heart beating, ventilated, um, and they progress to brain death, that's when we, um, again, have some clinical triggers. Um, if, if they're going to be brain death testing, if they're showing signs that they don't have reflexes um, or that they're not able to maintain themselves without the ventilator support. Um, there's a process for that and there's some some specific testing and some specific you know scans that we can do to identify uh, blood flow into the brain that's when that patient would be considered um, potentially an organ full-on organ uh, donor for um, um, brain death um, and again that's when LifeNet Health they come in um, when those patients meet those triggers we have a responsibility to refer them and then they can see in their registry whether or not that patient was uh, registered as a donor. How tight is the time window to make this all work? Uh, we have 60 minutes to refer um, whether they have died or whether they're um, meeting clinical triggers as, as a still heart beating ventilated patient. Um, and then it just depends on, on the process of what they're doing, if it's tissue um, and bone um, and cornea versus if it's full on organ. Um, and so that's, you know, two different processes. Um, and there are some options with uh, organ donation, whether it's a live donor or um, a deceased donor. And does the process happen in an operating theater? Is it done in the morgue? Is it done in the ER? What's the, the harvesting? They, um, so the, they do that in OR. Um, and they do, you know, those those samples um, in the OR in a controlled setting. So it's um, you're getting, you know, everything is very controlled so that you set that patient, that recipient up for best possible chance of, of taking that, um, whether it's bone graft, skin graft, um, or full-on organs. Matt Miller. Depending on the time of death, the cause of death, obviously you're talking about you know various organs that can or, or may not be able to be donated. What is the timetable um, in, in the donation actually being placed into or upon another person? That sounds like a very short window as well. Mm -hmm. So once the process starts, uh, say the patient's declared brain dead, um, we start maintaining functions um, of the body and, and doing some special things to make sure we can preserve, you know, uh, full on organ would be both lungs, heart, liver, which they can usually separate and do two donors, pancreas, um, both kidneys um, and intestines. So uh, once that process starts, uh, they start looking for recipients. Um, they will only take organs that they have recipients for or if it's something that they could do research on and, and look at something particular um, to get a little bit more information and research an organ that's having a specific disease process. So um, once they do that, it's about a 72-hour turnaround for us to go to the OR um, because they have to do very specific matching for these patients. Once they take that, um, once that organ is procured from our OR, uh, they have three hours um, to get that into a uh, recipient. The um, caveat is kidneys. Um, they've been able to create what they call a cycler. Um, so it puts those kidneys on this device that cycles fluids and, and essentially keeps it going so that they have a little bit longer time to be able to transplant that um, and, and have a little bit longer window to be able to find a recipient for that or maybe if they're a little bit further out of the, the, the three hour window. Mm -hmm. So that window sounds like if if someone is an organ donor here in our area, um, that organ is probably not getting to someone in California. It's got to be someone within three hours mm -hmm. of flying and or driving time. Yep, and and us as the um, as the organization caring for that mm -hmm. patient. We don't know where those organs are going. Okay. The the transplant surgeons come. Um, to work with the procurement team to get the organs. They take them back and then they um, perform the surgery on the recipients. So they come get them, they mm -hmm. inspect them, they look at them, 
and they make sure that they all look good and healthy. Mm. Um, and there are times where they'll come, um, and once they start the procurement, they'll look at an organ and they'll say, "I don't like the way this looks. I'm not certainly I'm not a surgeon, so I don't mm-hmm. know what that looks like on their end." And they'll say, "I don't. It, it's too risky to to do mm-hmm. a transplant with that organ." So they'll, you know, even though it it was a match, it looked like you know labs and all of the numbers and all of the testing look like it was a good mm-hmm. organ once they you know get in there and actually physically and visually inspect it um, may not be something that they want to transplant so they opt out of it so does the I, I presume the patients prepped at that point do they just go back to the waiting list yep hmm. that must be heartbreaking for yeah. the family and everybody involved mm-hmm. yeah Joni Stenick and Teresa McCabe from WVU Medicine are with us here in the program. And April is Donate Life Month. And all during the course of April, you're doing some things at the different locations, Teresa, correct? We are. We had our flag raisings yesterday at uh, Berkeley and Jefferson Medical Centers where we raised the organ donor flag uh, in front of the hospitals on the flagpole. Mm-hmm. Um, we have um, various um, Educational, I would say, awareness types of projects going on on social media. Um, this is one of today, those. Today, having jo- absolutely yeah. having Joni come talk today on your show, um, and and we're doing some other. Um, we're actually what's the day that we're having? Um, Blue Green Day. April fourteenth um, is National Donor Day, so uh, we will be participating. Um, Many people know it as Blue Green Day. You wear blue green to raise awareness for organ, eye, and tissue donation. I jumped the gun on that today. Yeah. 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 So uh, how did you wind up in this field, Jenny? Um, So I have been in nursing for over 20 years. Um, I've specifically worked in critical care most of my career. Um, I had an early start in critical care in neurosurgery ICU. Um, So we saw a lot of patients that came through um, that venue who, you know, unfortunately had um, accidents or circumstances where they uh, became brain dead. And so organ donation started as a passion of mine, recognizing the, the value that the generous decision to give your organs you know, when when you are no longer a, a viable human being, to pass that to someone else who can, um, you know, continue their life, and so recognizing the hope that that gives for other people, um, has has certainly started my passion for um, organ donation, and then um, entering into leadership and critical care ultimately um, brought this program to me. So I continue to make sure that. You know, we stay abreast of how to, how to be more, um, you know, active in, in promoting this. Um, at some point in time, I may need an organ. Um, I have had, as telling Teresa on the way here, people don't realize, like, the, the little pieces of information and the little pieces of organ transplant or, or tissue tra- transplant. And, you know, sometimes you find yourself needing dental work and they have to do some um, construction with maybe bone. And so they use bone fragments from donors. Um, corneal transplants, um, you had an unfortunate accident and had a, um, you know, an injury to your eye that you know, did something to your cornea, transplanting that cornea comes from a donor, or a hereditary eye disease that, you know, may end up, you know, in a, a situation where the person goes blind, um, you know, corneal transplant again for those kinds of things. So skin grafts for burns are, are pretty common. Um, so I think there's a lot more to it w- other than just focusing on the organ donation in itself. My cervical spine was rebuilt with cadaver bone. Yeah. So it was, you know, it, it's, there's little bits and pieces. They all work. Talk about bone marrow donation, because that's a living donation, right? So there are um, some uh, several options for living donation. Uh, bone marrow um, is one of them. I'll be honest, I'm not as familiar with the bone marrow and the living um, donor options. Um, but it is one of one of the few um there's also the ability to be living donor for um, liver and kidney. So, you mentioned earlier that you don't necessarily know where an organ may be going. Mm-hmm. Do you get many stories 
in the end, though, do, do, do you get a chance to hear some of those? I know I've, I've seen some videos of uh, a gentleman whose daughter uh, passed in an accident, and, mm-hmm. and you see him meeting a now 20-some-year-old who has his daughter's heart and just the emotion that is there. Do you ever get to hear and be a part of those? There are um, some pieces of it, LifeNet Health, after um, a donation has has went through the process, they will send some information back, like the kidney went to a two-year-old, or, or I mean, a liver went to, a piece of the liver went to a two-year-old, or a kidney went to a, a 55-year-old who, you know, now does not have to be on dialysis. So they'll give us some general pieces of information, or, you know, and then if they send something for research, they'll also give us that, you know, there was something particular about the heart, and so they, they took it for research. You mentioned pieces or, or of, of, of an organ mm-hmm. as opposed to the entire organ being donated. How, how would pieces of an organ come into play? The liver they can split. Um, that's one of the few organs that they can do is, is, is really um, the liver. The lungs don't have to go in the same pair. They can separate the lungs, but the liver can actually be split. So you can get a lung from one person and a lung from another person? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you covered this earlier and I missed it, my apologies. Does blood type figure in to who can take what organ? It does. Uh-huh. They look at, at blood type. They look at overall health, any type of um, active infections, um, you know, during time of COVID, at one point in time, if you had COVID, you were completely excluded from being a donor. Whether it was organ, eye, or tissue, you were just excluded. Um, so here we are, full circle, and now that's no longer an exclusion criteria. Mm-hmm. April is Donate Life Month, and if you'd like to uh, sign up to be an organ donor, how can you do that, Joni? You can go to www.registerme.org or you can go to www.donatelife.org. Are the majority of organs that are being uh, transported driven to where they're supposed to go, or are they flown sometimes? Um, Most of the major organs are flown. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the kidneys, if they put them on cyclers, they can be driven, um, but because of the three-hour time window, um, they have to be flown. And once they hit the ground, is is there like a police escort for the organ to get to the hospital? Yeah. Um, or some on, Nimrod like me driving as fast as he can through the city streets <laughs> trying to get it there. No, they have they have a service that on on the receiving end. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't attest to what they do there, but I know on on our end when they bring those surgeons in, they are escorted in. Um, they have a specific service of wherever they're coming from. They bring them in specifically mm-hmm. escorted so that um, they can facilitate them getting there. Do you have any uh, records or stats as to how uh, we do in the Eastern Panhandle in terms of organ donation and organ recipients or statewide in West Virginia? I don't know specific statewide. I know that, you know, overall across the nation, there's about 104,000 people waiting for an organ. Most of them are kidney, and then the second um, in line are liver. Um, And then the statistics are, are pretty astounding. About every 17 minutes, someone dies waiting on that list. Um, Out of a full-on donation, you can get, now they say nine, um, organs transplanted because they can split the liver. And you can help over 150,000 people, or 150 people with um, tissue and eye donation. Um, But it it is, you know, like I said earlier, you know, 60% of people are only registered to donate, but majority of people support donation. So it it is a, um, you know, upside down issue in in trying to get uh, organs and eyes and tissues donated. Have they asked questions why, like in that polling that that shows that 90% say, yeah, that's great, but only 60% get involved. Do they ask questions to try to find out why those other uh, 30% don't get involved? Yeah, a lot of people think that, oh, you know, I, I have, you know, comorbidities, so they wouldn't want anything from me. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I'm too old or my age. Um, but a lot of it is the, the uh, comorbidities and the other health disparities that, you know, they think that uh, that attributes to. Um, you know, there's there's the other myth of, you know, well, they'll just, you know, 
do something so they can just donate my organs you know like maybe i won't get the best possible care to live because they'll just want to donate my organs if i'm an organ donor oh, is the check mark on my license all that's necessary where it's a very emotional time mm-hmm. in the er when families gathered and all of this and and the loved one has passed is is my wish on my driver's license the final say or is it then the argument among the family say no i don't want to do that is is there that extra step that has to be passed it so that can be a process too um your uh, commitment on your driver's license is enough to say that that's what i would wish to have done Mm -hmm. It does become complicated with, you know, families um, because they can ultimately question it. But your your commitment on your driver's license is enough. I think that's a point to encourage people that if you have registered, make sure your family is aware of what your wishes are, um, because then there's no question as to whether you did that on accident mm-hmm. or whether you, you know, fully decided to do that and that's what you wish, um, you know. For the driver's license piece, I think one thing worth mentioning is just you have to be over the age of 18 in order to do that. Um, Even though people get their driver's license before that, you cannot register until you're at least 18 years of age. The registration through the DMV, does that automatically put it onto that list that you talked about that you would go to online? In other words, you may not have your driver's license with you at that time of passing. Yes. Yep. That registers you to that to that um, database uh, ultimate registry so any way that you register whether it's through the dmv whether it's through the internet um, those are all uh, housed in one database um, that lifenet health then researches to see if you're on there Joni, you mentioned that some people might not donate because they think that whatever they did in their lives or their body it just their organs aren't worth donating what would disqualify you from being an organ donor assuming that you are of age and have made an appropriate legal decision to donate? Um, Are there any medical conditions? Nothing really. So. Um, the the only one piece is, is cancer patients typically, um, but that doesn't mean that they won't look at perhaps tissues, but for full organ, um, but that doesn't mean that they won't look at tissue. Diabetes? No. Not a disqualifier? No. Because it's very common in today's society, and I'm guessing a lot of people think maybe I can't be because I'm diabetic, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So otherwise, good to go, right? Yeah. Well, uh, we fired a lot of questions at you mm-hmm. today, yeah. and you handled them flawlessly, much better than the three of us could have. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. So great job, and uh, I learned a lot today. I know our audience did as well. Is there anything else you can leave us with before we conclude this segment, Joni? Um, if if you want more information, go to donatelife.gov. I encourage everybody to you know think about it, consider it, um, get yourself informed, and, and do the research. If you have questions, you know reach out to these organizations and ask the questions. Um, and if you decide, uh, sign up and register. Um, to be an eye tissue organ donor. Uh, it's a very generous gift that you know gives someone else hope to continue living their life. And that could be at the age of you know six months or more. I just want to jump in. You mentioned eye tissue organ. Do you have to sign up for those in any individual? Like would someone maybe say, I'm willing to, to donate something but not other things? Or No, you, once you sign up to it's, register, okay. um, that's, that's your signature to register. You don't need them where you're going next anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, thank you so much, Joni. Thank you. Teresa, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great stuff.